Dimitri is a civil engineer with a major in structural engineering, currently holding the position of assistant professor in the materials and environment group at the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences at TU Delft in the Netherlands. His research focus is on multi-scale mechanics of cement-based materials, numerical modeling of concrete durability, and additive manufacturing of concrete, and he has made an outstanding scientific contribution to this field. He has received notable recognitions, such as the prestigious Simon Stevin Gezel Prize, awarded in 2015 by the Dutch Technology Foundation, and Dr. Sadija has been actively involved in RILAM DCFTC on durability and service life of concrete under the influence of free stall cycles combined with chloride penetration, and also in task group 2.1 on digital fabrication within the FIB. He has been remarkably active on the fronts of doctoral and master research guidance as journal peer reviewer and guest editor, and is currently also a managing editor with construction and building materials. So I would like to invite uh, Branko Savija to give his uh, lecture on the topic of his uh, research. So, uh, Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I will try to share my screen now. So I would like to thank Ralem for allowing me to give this presentation and selecting me for this uh, for this award, and also especially the organizers and Eduardo who have sent numerous emails in the past few days to organize this because it's been very quickly organized. A lot of efforts have been put um, into it, but I think, it, I think it works quite well so far, and I'm sure the conference will be of a good quality. So uh, thank you, all of you. As Professor De Berli has introduced me, my name is Branko Xavi. I work at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands uh, for the for a number of years already. And I would also like to acknowledge all the people that have worked with me over the years and still do. Eric, Monzi, Gidon, Claudia, Yare, Ze, and many master and bachelor students that have contributed to this work. So I want to talk about uh, plastic techniques and numerical models for understanding and development of cementitious materials. So um, I would like to first discuss why, why uh, why this topic? And a few people have mentioned the importance of, of uh, theory and of simulation. So I would like first to introduce a proposition given by Professor Humming from, from the United States who says, the purpose of computing is insight and not numbers. So that means that we should use our theoretical developments to understand the phenomena that we are looking at instead of using them to completely mimic and fit our calculations to our results. And I think this is a very, very nice way of putting that. And I think this is also what I try to do with, with my work. Another interesting uh, proposition has been brought about by uh, Professor Van Meer, who used to be a professor at Delft University at ETH and has done a lot of work on fracture of concrete. And in his book, Fracture Process of Concrete, he says, the whole theory and experiment play their role in the science and engineering. And the interaction between these two is crucial. People who do experiments and people who do the theory development must speak the same language. From my understanding, this means that preferably there should be people working in the same projects, people sitting in the same offices, in the same department, and also a lot of times the same people should be doing these two types of work. So uh, I think our developments in construction materials, concrete, uh, as an example that I'm working in, should involve both experiments, development of experimental techniques, and also simulations, developments of theory, developments of models, numerical models, analytical models, and these two should be used, in my opinion, together in as much as possible. And in that way, we can use each of these uh, approaches to understand the other, and then to develop new materials, finally, to build better and safer structures. Uh, and of course, with structures, you still need to rely a bit on experience, empirical parameters, and safety factors. But the better we understand our materials, the better we can build in the future. And um, I have done my PhD thesis also in Delft some years ago uh, with the title of Experimental and Numerical Investigation of Chloride Ingress in Fracked Concrete. So already in the title, it's clear that I've used both experiments and numerical simulations. And trying to combine that to understand the underlying uh, phenomenon. 
So I've done experiments uh, together with the uh, Baum Institute in Berlin, Germany, to try to quantify the effects of cracking on chloride ingress and chloride penetration in cracks. So we used a technique called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which was developed at the BOM, and which is still one of the most advanced techniques in, in this field. But at the same time, I developed numerical models to simulate coupled mechanical and transport uh, processes in, to, related to chloride ingress in cracks and in cracked concrete. And this, I tried to use both of these approaches together uh, to sort of uh, build each other out and try to understand what is going on in this process. And from then on, I tried to use this approach in all of my work. So I will go through some of the work that I've used and some of the examples of this type of approach. So I think we can use this approach, combina combination of experiments and theory to gain insight into the behavior of cementitious materials. Now, I think first, of, first thing that we look into when we think of cementitious materials, we look into the mechanical problem. And we know that concrete and cement are uh, multi-scale heterogeneous materials with heterogeneities at different length scales. So already in the 80s, Professor Wittmann has uh, sort of defined three scales of observation for, for concrete. So we have the macro scale, which is sort of a centimeter to meter scale, our structural scale, where we look at concrete as a continuum, a homogeneous material with certain properties. And this is typically where we perform our tests, our standard tests of compression, tension, also our durability tests are typically performed at this scale. If we go to a scale lower, to a sort of a millimeter to centimeter scale, we see concrete not as homogeneous anymore, but as an assembly of aggregates suspended in a hardened cement paste. And then at this scale, we can still perform some tests. It becomes a bit more difficult, but with some effort, we can, we can still do it. We can understand how aggregates, how heterogeneities influence the mechanical properties, the transport properties, and so on of cementitious materials. Now, we actually want to go one scale lower in order to understand this. So the scale of hardened cement phase, we can distinguish between cement hydrates, between unhydrated uh, particles, capillary porosity, and so on. And how do we go about doing experiments at this scale? Turns out that already for about 15 years, people have done a lot of experiments to understand the elastic properties of hydration phases in hydrated cement phase. Nanonotation techniques have been used widely, and we are able to quantify the elastic moduli and the hardness properties of uh, inner products, outer products, clinker, uh, calcium uh, hydroxide, and other phases in our cement phase. And then using analytical or numerical uh, techniques, we can use homogenization and go from these properties on the micro scale, upscale them to the meso scale, and finally upscale them to the macro scale. And we can obtain elastic properties of cementitious materials using homogenization. But we are, of course, not only interested in elastic properties, we're also interested in fracture and in strength of our materials. So we try to develop techniques that will enable us to sort of mimic this process in predicting mechanical properties of cementitious materials. So we developed a technique to pre prepare uh, very small uh, cement paste samples by uh, gluing a very thin layer of cement paste on a glass substrate and dicing it using a precision saw as shown in this figure. And we end up with a matrix of very small cubes of hydrated cement paste, which we will then use to test and measure its response to mechanical loading. Now, for this, we will we use typically a nano indenter, which is also used for indentation and elastic moduli determinations of materials. But we adapt the setup so we can directly test the mechanical properties of these small volumes. And this is what it looks like in, um, in an SEM. We are, uh, because we cannot do direct tension experiments, unfortunately, we can subject these specimens to different forms of splitting. And as we increase the load, the specimen, of course, breaks in the end. And during this process, we're able to measure the load displacement curves that our material can, can sustain. Now, from this, we have still global properties of our cement base at this very small scale, but we are still interested in the in properties of individual hydrated uh, hydration phases in the material. So here we go and 
to use our numerical simulations again. So we use microstructures for our materials that we can again get from either microstructural simulations such as the HIMOSTRUCT or in this case from X-ray computer tomography. And then we can subject these microstructures to the same types of loads that we have done in our experiments. And by uh, inverse analysis, we can set the properties of our microstructural faces, unhydrated cement, inner products, and outer products, in such a way that we can mimic the global behavior of our microvoid. So now we know, this we knew already from nano indentation, the young, youngest modulus of different faces. Now we know the strength properties of in our hydrated cement phase. We can use that to simulate tensile properties of these microstructures. So here we see three microstructures with three different water cement ratios. And this will provide us with constitutive equations for simulating uh, concrete at the higher scale for cement phase. Now, except the cement phase, we also need to know what is happening at the aggregate cement phase interface, the so-called ITZ zone. So we use a similar approach using, again, a micro dicing saw. We can prepare specimens that contain hard cement, harder cement paste on an uh, aggregate substrate. But because we want to know the tensile properties of this zone, we will now subject these materials to bending. And by applying bending loads, we can, again, uh, fracture these materials. So this is a, an image of a fracture surface at an SEM, which is also torturous. Uh, and then we have uh, different pores that guide the fracture process. But again, in order to get the mechanical properties of this very thin interface, we need to use combination with numerical simulations because our measurements give us a global response of the micro volume. Simulations will enable us to get the local response of this contact. Again, fitting the numerical simulations to the experiment allows us to mimic the global behavior and then again, from here, we can derive constitutive equations that we can use in higher scale simulations. So now we go to the higher scale. Higher scale is the mortar scale. As I said, we can do experiments in this scale. In, in this figure, you can see a very small uh, 10 millimeter mortar specimen with two notches that will be subjected to direct tension. We can also, again, simulate this experiment by uh, creating a micro volume of our material. We have in red uh, sand particles, we have entrapped air, and we have in gray our hydrated cement paste. And from our microscale simulations, we know the constitutive relation for the cement paste, and we know the constitutive relation for the ITZ. For aggregates, we can assume that they are linear elastic. So we use these properties and then simulate the experiment at a higher scale. And we can see in this figure a comparison between our experimental results given in gray and our modeling results for three different assumptions. And actually, we have a very good match between our model and our experimental findings. Furthermore, we can compare the crack paths at this, that we get from an experiment, which is a tortuous crack, starting from one of the notches and then connecting to the other notch, with our simulation results. And we see quite a good, quite a good qualitative match. So, what we have actually done is, we have started from the micro scale, we have not used any calibration or fitting, and we don't use any empirical parameters. And we're still able to predict with this multi-scale modeling, computational and experimental approach, we are able to predict the global behavior of our specimen. So with this, we can then play with the parameters at the micro scale with different additives and see how that will affect the behavior of our mortar. We have also tried to use this experimental approach to study the size effect of hydrated cement paste. So uh, concrete and other quasi-abrated materials are known to exhibit a strong size effect, meaning that the larger the volume that we test, the, the, less, the lower the strength that we measure will be. So we use these microcubes of 100 by 100 by 100 micrometers, and we created specimens with the same geometry of larger sizes all the way up to 40 millimeter size. And we subject them to the same boundary conditions. Because these specimens are glued at the bottom, we also do the same with all the specimens. So we glue them at the bottom and subject them to splitting at the top. And in this way, we can, uh, in a way, uh, estimate the splitting tensile strength of our material. 
And then we can compare our results to different analytical and uh, empirical uh, size effect relations. And here we see a co comparison between our results given in black and three most uh, widely used uh, size effect relations. And actually, in the range that we are testing, all three seem to fit quite well. So we still were not able to go to the low range of, uh, of, the, of the size effect curves. Now, at the moment, we are trying to expand this work to study non-static loading, to study fatigue. So we are performing uh, fatigue experiments with cyclic loading on these small micro beams, starting from the cement paste and going to the ITZ. So we do repeated loadings until the specimen fails and try to understand what happens. Now, what happens is unexpected, but when you think about it, it could have been expected is that we have a lot of creep occurring in these specimens. So actually, first we need to understand the creep and that we are doing at the moment. And when that is finished, we will go back and study the fatigue. Uh, another field where you can use this combined experimental and numerical approach and use it quite often is to develop new materials, materials with added functionalities. Uh, so one of the materials that we are working on in Delft is self-healing concrete with superabsorbent polymers. So superabsorbent polymers are materials that are able to expand quite significantly in contact with water. And these materials have been uh, used quite a lot in the field of self-healing materials because as we see here, when a crack occurs, we will have uh, opening your water can penetrate and reach the SAP particle, this particle will swell, and hopefully close the crack for water penetration, and thereby increasing the resistance to transport and protecting our reinforcement, for example. We can also do the same thing in our model, where we can pack our SAP particles in a volume, we can crack that volume, and then we can study what happens in this crack. So we can um, simulate the kinetics of the swelling of our particle and see how that affects capillary absorption of water in cementitious materials. So this is much easier done with a model than it is with experiments. We can easily vary the amount of SAP particles ranging in this case from 0.5 to 1.5%. And we see that as we add the SAP particles, the penetration front becomes narrow. What we can also do is we can check the influence of different crack widths. And we see here that if cracks are quite wide, there's not much we can expect from these SAP particles. We can also play with the properties of the SAP particles because the swelling capacity of different chemistries is different. In the end, we can provide some guidelines for design of these materials in forms of graphs such as given here. Of course, these graphs are not quantitatively will not quantitatively match 100% what will be observed in every experiment, but they will provide guidelines that will help us guide our experimental efforts and minimize the waste of time and material that we need to develop and optimize these types of materials. Another uh, area that we are working in quite extensively is use of 3D printed reinforcement in some dishes materials. Now, 3D printing has been uh, quite uh, widely, uh, widely used in the last five years or so. Basically, you provide a computer design model, and then you can use an additive manufacturing technology. For example, we use fused deposition modeling to create a model and to create the material that you can use for different purposes. And we try to print reinforcement that we can optimize in order to improve our material behavior, of our cementation material. So we use polymeric reinforcement in this case, and then we try to use that in a composite way. So we have tried with different designs, very simple in the beginning, from triangular, triangular designs, and we have here what we call large triangles, mixed triangles, and small triangles design. And we subject, we put these materials as reinforcement in fine grade mortars, and we subject these materials to bending loads and to uniaxial tension. And in the case of bending loads, we have a denser mesh in the middle because this is where our constant moment region is. And we think this will help us optimize the reinforcement of our material. We also, in parallel, implement the same reinforcements and the same geometries into our numerical models and we believe if we can mimic the behavior from these experiments, 
then we can use these models to further optimize and design the material. So just uh, briefly some results from this research. On the left-hand side, we have cracks from four-point bending experiments in three different types of reinforcement geometries. Large triangles, we don't have, we have one or two cracks forming. Mixed triangles, we have multiple cracking in the constant moment region, and small triangles show the same. And our model is also able to more or less uh, mimic this behavior. So we now can use this model, change the geometry of the reinforcement, for example, its volume, and so on, and optimize it instead of testing every time a new geometry and seeing what happens. Now, uh, also in terms of experiments, we have performed digital image correlation experiments on uniaxial tension specimens. So we see here in figures A and B reference specimens without reinforcement that collapse in a brittle way. With large triangles, we have some ductility, but it's mainly provided by the pullout of the reinforcement from the matrix. And if we introduce smaller triangles in these figures, we get multiple cracking and strain hardening behavior of our material. So this means, again, that we can use this technology, but we need to optimize it in order to get the performance of the material that we want. And this is something that we're also working at on at the moment. Now, we also think that we can use this type of experimental and numerical approach to optimize the use of new technologies. In the past, I would say five years, there has been a lot of research on 3D printing of concrete, where uh, normally, and most of the times, you use uh, extrusion-based 3D printing, as shown in this figure, where we extrude layer upon layer of fresh cementation material and try to build structures with uh, different forms and quite quickly without using formwork, which should increase the construction speed, decrease the costs, and so on. But as we see in this figure already, if we don't do this well, the material will collapse under its self-weight, under the imperfections of the geometry, and so on. And we don't want to have that. We want to know what will happen with our material before we make a large-scale structure. And then we can be confident that this will work in our lab or in the industrial scale. And then we can make structures such as the one shown on the right-hand side, which is a, a bridge built in Eindhoven University, and um, it's now placed close to Eindhoven. It's completely 3D printed, but then again, they, they connected different segments using uh, pre-stressing reinforcement. But still, if you want to use this technology on a large scale, you need to understand, uh, you need to understand how it works. Now, there are two basic ways that the material, that the structure can fail during 3D printing. First failure mode that is interesting and important is so-called plastic collapse. So a material is during this process still in a relatively fresh state. It does not have a lot of strength. And if we add a lot of layers on top of it, the material cannot hold this and can collapse due to, due to the load. And we call this plastic collapse. This is one of the main reasons that uh, 3D prints fail. Another reason is the so-called elastic buckling, where the complete structure can overturn due to geometry nonlinearity occurring in the process. And if we are to model this process, if we are to model 3D printing processes of some additional materials, our models need to be able to, to capture both of these modes, the plastic collapse and the elastic buckling of our 3D printed material. And we are currently developing models, such as the one shown in the left-hand side, which should be able to do this. So we can build our material layer by layer, as shown here. And we see as we build more and more layers, we get more and more deformation because the material, although it hardens already at the bottom, it's still relatively in a fresh, in a fresh state. And finally, if we add enough load, the material will collapse. Similar thing is shown here on the right-hand side. And this is a typical example of plastic collapse as seen here in experiments from this, from this publication. And our model is qualitatively already able to predict that. Now the other failure mode, the elastic buckling is also, sorry, it's also very important in which we, we add layer upon layer as we see here in this experimental video of the material. And because the situation is not completely symmetrical and the load is not centric, the material just fail, falls on its side. And our model can already predict this type of behavior. And in that way, we can also optimize the material because in the material properties, we are already 
used to measuring, but in the 3D printing uh, process, it's not only the material that leads our process, it's also the process parameters, how fast we print, what is the shape of our print, and so on. So our model should help us design also the materials and design the printing technology for 3D printing of concrete. Now, what about the future? I think the approach that I have described can be also used in the future. We are going to still continue combining advanced experimental techniques that we will also further develop new experiments, new setups with numerical simulations, also analytical simulations, and learn from one another in this process. But I think the developments nowadays and the amount of experimental work that we do will allow us to use other technologies. We can rely on data at the moment. We collect a lot of data from our experiments. We can use technologies such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and learn from this to inform our numerical simulations and our experiments and help us design new, better, and improved materials. And just one example is a publication from a, from a colleague from Delft University, Mechanical Engineering. They have developed a super compressible metal material using machine learning approaches where they have fed a certain amount of data to a model. And using a very simple 3D printer, they were able to create a material from a brittle uh, base material that can be collapsed up to 90% of, of, its, uh, of its height and then recover completely without damage. So using machine learning approaches, they were able to do this without extensive experimental testing. So they were, the machine learning algorithms can tell us in which direction to develop our materials. And I think this is something that we should think about and we should use and utilize in the future. And this is my last slide. I would like to thank you again. And hopefully there are some questions that can be discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Branko, for this very nice overview of your work, both uh, modeling and experimental, a very nice combination. So any questions from the audience here? Yeah, yes. there is one. Uh, Joaquim Barros, thank you very much for the impressive presentation. So I would like to know if you are planning for close future. Okay, thank you. If you, uh, if you are planning for fu uh, close future to, uh, to use uh, hybrid reinforcement in, in 3D printer in order to optimize not only the rheological properties of the material, but also the, uh, the mechanical characteristics, because I suppose we have a lot of potential of this internal reinforcement in terms of stabilizing the material. Are you planning to do something? Uh, yes, uh, actually we have a project running on uh, 3D printing of strain hardening cementitious composite because one of the main issues with 3D printing concrete is that there is no reinforcement in it. It can be added later on. So we actually are working now uh, on developing uh, strain hardening mixtures for 3D printing. And it's not easy because it brings a lot of challenges in terms of geology. And if we, if we solve that, we get problems in terms of hardening. So the 3D printing of concrete actually poses a lot of challenges compared to the normal way of thinking. We solve one problem, or we create a problem at another end. We are working on that, but it's, it's not easy. Yes, because even when we place material by layers, the, the connections between, so you don't have a, a fiber that is crossing uh, layer by layer. So the yeah, that, that's another problem we had. We had a master's student working on that. We have some ideas, but okay. it, it is not easy. And I think in lab scale, we can maybe do something, but practicality will still remain an issue for, for several years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we can maybe have a look at the, the questions online. So can we see which has the most votes or are they ranked? At this moment, they no, are not just posed, but not voted. <laughs> so maybe we can just, uh, yeah. Work. So the first one is, well, it may be it is uh, related to the question that was already just asked, like effect of 3D printed uh, polymeric reinforcement on the layers bond behavior. So I think this was more or less already uh, handled, unless Branko, you want to add something still to that. Specific question. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's the same question. I think it, this is related to uh, what Professor Barros was asking about printing and adding a fiber reinforced mixture. And I think the question here is related to the, the way that we print the reinforcement. 
And it's it's actually gonna... on the layers bond behavior, effect on the layers bond behavior. Ah, okay. Yeah, then maybe it's the same question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. then uh, there is another question asking, um, how you make a microstructure of mortar? Uh, do you consider only very fine aggregate particles and is it then representative? Yeah, we have used only fine aggregate particles and probably not representative, but it's the only thing we can do at, uh, at lab scale because the, the printer that we use to print reinforcement is just a simple FDM printer with a relatively small build board. But if, if we show potential technology, we hope to apply for projects to, to do bigger things. Okay, so that's a limitation at the moment, but maybe yeah. in the future it could be solved. Yes. Um, so yeah. And then, yeah, actually the last one is actually also related to 3D <laughs> printing of reinforcement. So I think it's all in the same line. So maybe no further explanation is needed. But maybe mm -hmm. in the meantime, other people in the audience here have additional questions. I'm just looking around. Not specifically, I guess. So I guess we will move then to the, the second uh, Colonetti medal presentation, but uh, certainly on uh, my behalf and uh, also for the whole audience here, congratulations with the medal, Thank which I can much. now hand over to you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but Sheffield is not uh, so far a travel for you, so I hope you will be able to come there and then uh, you will have hopefully an additional <laughs> ceremony for you. <laughs> if everything goes well, I will come. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye and have a good day and out. Thank you.